welcome to this lecture on transgender ideology and gender dysphoria, a Catholic response. The topic for this section of the book we're looking at uh, is the science of tr the transgender brain, uh, 1995 to the present. Uh, I'm Dr. Thibault. Uh, this is a bit of a, a study guide that goes along with the book for anyone who either uh, needs help with it or is would rather just hear lectures rather than read the book. So last time we looked at 7.1, section 7.1, which was about is there a difference between a male or female brain. So uh, if you're interested in that, go back to the previous video. We have now, now that we've established that there are male and female brains, although there are not a lot of huge differences between male and female brains, uh, sometimes even small differences make big uh, have big consequences. So uh, we don't, we're not, you know, we're not experts on the, the human brain, right? E not just me, but as human beings, we are not experts. This is kind of the, uh, the final frontier uh, in human exploration is the human brain, since it's still somewhat unknown. So if you recall, Catherine Wu pointed out a number of cases, which she said uh, definitively proves that transgender people have brains most similar to that of their identity than to their natal sex. Uh, so now it has been proven, right? Uh, okay. Catherine Wu from Harvard says <laughs> that uh, this has, uh, that there is proof that uh, transgender people have the opposite sex brain. So uh, it could be a woman trapped in a man's body or a man trapped in a woman's body, right? Their brain is in the wrong body, right? That's kind of the a common description. So is this true, right? She gave a list of um, studies. So let's look at the studies. What do they say? You know, read the studies. Uh, most medical studies aren't that long. So this isn't like reading thousands of pages. It's reading a uh, hundred pages or so. Uh, so we can do this. So the first look, if you, again, last one, male, female brains. We looked at many features which determine male and female brains. A lot of it has to do with verbal skills, communication, uh, thinking, uh, gender identity. Not really, right? We haven't really looked. A lot of the male and female stuff within the brain, we don't tend to think that it has anything to do with gender. It's just, uh, I guess, uh, it, in some sense, but it, in terms of gender identity, we haven't looked at anything specifically like that within uh, the last section. So where might, in the brain, where might something like gender expression or sexuality be in the brain? That's a good question, right? Is it in the cortex? Is it in the frontal lobe? You know, where is this? You know, the brain's made up of regions. And pretty fairly, we could say, well, you know, the hypothalamus is a very important area when it comes to sexuality, sexual development. Um, so the hypothalamus might be a good uh, point to start, right? So it's not a random point in the brain say, well, is there a difference between males and females or transgender people in the amygdala, right? No, the, tr the hypothalamus is a good place to start. So Dr. Zhao from the University of Amsterdam, he starts with the amygdala, uh, I mean the hypothalamus. So he's looking at these bed nucleus of the uh, stria termul terminalis. So these are section, this is the sites within the hypothalamus which are active, right? There's these sites. So is the hypothalamus more like men or like women? So men have a 44% larger uh, uh, BST sites, right? Uh, so if we want to look at this, section A, so this is a heterosexual male here. You can see the dark shading and the, the dots in it that show uh, the, the BST sites. Now, if we look at B, this is a heterosexual woman. You can see it is much lighter in a cross section. It's not as dense or defined as the, the male section. Below, right by my head, this is the heterosexual, uh, the homosexual male. Uh, 
uh, BST site in a cross section. And to get this, they had to take a post-mortem brain, meaning a, a brain of a dead person, and slice it really thin and put it in wax and put it, look at it under a microscope. So it requires you to have people who have died and donated their brains to science. So um, as you can see, it's per pretty similar to the hetero heterosexual male. It's dark, dense, the uh, sites are very well defined. Right, it's going to look a little bit different, but it's, pretty, it's much closer to the heterosexual male than it is to the, the female, that's for sure. And then if we look at uh, the transgender male to female uh, hypothalamus, the BST sites, very faint, right? Very light, very much less defined, um, a lot fewer sites in it, right? It is more similar to the female. BST sites. So this uh, trans transgender male to females have BST sites similar, more similar to that of females, right? So that is some type of indication that there might be um, morphologies within the brain which are specific to transgender people, right? That this is good. This is interesting data, right? Uh, this is good. But you know, this is we have to really look at you know how they did it and everything. So the sample size of transgender individuals is only six. Right, that's not a big sample size, right? It's, it's not a it's not great. But they're using brains of dead people who've donated their bodies to science who were transgender. There's just not that many that exist at the time. So it's not that they were negligent. It's just very limited supply available. So likewise, they used six of each of the other categories as a control. So it's 24 total to start with. Um, when we look at this graph over here on the left-hand side, the first column is BST sites for uh, heterosexual men. So it's up in the, the volume rates about like two and a half. Homosexual men, it's actually even a little bit higher, but similar to the, homo, the heterosexual men. Then females, you can see it drops considerably less, right? They have 44% smaller BST volume than in men. And then if we look at the last category on the right, uh, male to female is the lowest of them all, but most similar to female. So this is very, this is very interesting. Now here are some of the problems with this study, and this isn't something that Dr. Zhou is unaware of. He talks about it in the study. He's not being tricky. It's just these are the limitations of his study. Some of it is all of the men who were male to female, the, all six of them, they had been orchiectomized, meaning they've had they've been castrated, right, for a number of years. So. They've been castrated so they don't have the natural testosterone in their bloodstream for years, right? Some of them also received cross-sex hormones, right? Hormone blockers and cross-sex hormones. So how much of this has had an effect on the hypothalamus? If you orchiectomize somebody, does it change the structures in their brain, right? The lack of testosterone in their system will a lack of testosterone in your system shrink uh, the, the BST volume within the brain. That's very possible, right? It's very possible. Another thing uh, is all, m many of them, not all, many were uh, on HIV medications and, or, and had HIV, died of HIV, uh, had died of AIDS. So does this have an effect? We don't really know, but it's worth noting. Now, to get around some of these shortcomings of the study, Dr. Zhou, very smart man, uh, he looks at it and says, well, let's look at a case where a person, a heterosexual man, has been orchiectomized because he needed to for med medical reasons, nothing to do with transgender. What's his rate levels? Is He's been now orchiectomized, so should, he should, if if orchiectomized, if being castrated has this type of effect, then he should have BST levels similar to that of the male to female individuals, right? That, that would make sense. Well, but he doesn't. He has levels that are very similar to, actually a little bit higher than that, than those of 
uh, traditional heterosexual men. So archaeectomization did not affect his BST at all. Another one was an individual who had a tumor which caused him to produce estrogen. So he's a heterosexual man, but his body is producing estrogen because of a tumor, right? So this would be in cross, similar to somebody who's had cross-sex hormones for being transgender. What is his, right? Is he having uh, transgender levels of BSTC? No, he has typical male levels of BSTC. So orchiectomization and uh, estrogen did not seem to affect heterosexual individuals. Uh, so this is interesting, right? This is very interesting uh, in terms of the hypothalamus. It, nothing, to be clear, nothing is definitive, not with six samples uh, of people, but uh, especially with the orchiectomization and the and the, the cross-sex hormones, we could say, well, these two other individuals, they have proven that it's not that. Well, they give us, they indicate that it's not that, but one, a sample size of one does not indicate absolute scientific proof, right? It, not just, well, we have one case that's different, therefore it cannot be that. Well, we need a larger study, right? That That's the problem. Hard in 1995 when this is the best you got, though. This study was repeated again by a colleague of Dr. Zhao, uh, and he, and still the University of Amsterdam, the year 2000 now, they've increased the number of subjects, although they still have the original 26, remember the 24 plus the two outliers that they used to correct it. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it's a different study, but it's the same study. It's not that different because you're using even the same pool of people for the most part. You've added a few, but not that much. Now, the, the they call it the SOM, as they're looking at. These are active sites within the BTSC uh, sites, right? The, so th this is looking at another piece of the hypothalamus, but basically very similar, right? So what is the result? As you can see in the graph, male, pretty high, homosexual male, a little bit higher, very consistent with the last study, female, much lower, very consistent, the male to female, about the same as the female, right? So it's re, it's revalidated the, the 1995 study. Now what's interesting with this, it's still not a very large sample size, but what's interested with this is two more individuals have been added into the study who are unusual. Uh, one is a female to male transgender person, so somebody's gone from female to male, uh, who has not been chemically or, or, or medically treated that way, right? Not on cross-sex hormones or anything. If you see on this graph, this on the, all the way to the left, female to male, it's very high, even higher than the males, right? Much higher than the males, uh, notably. So clearly much more like the males than like the females. So that is very unusual, right? That's, again, only one sample size of one, but very interesting. The next is the Delta S7, which is an individual who was 84 years old when he died because we're still using post-mortem brains. Um, and he had never been uh, chemically or surgically altered at all, but he had cross-dressing uh, he cross-dressed, but there was nothing chemical or medical that was done. And he has a range right here in the, it's at the top of it, but it's within the male to female uh, range, uh, right? Or with, even within the female range. So this again would validate uh, this idea that there could be uh, an abnormality within the hypothalamus for transgender individuals. So this is quite possible. Again, still using small sample sizes and nothing is definitive, but it points in that direction, right? That's kind of the point of science is that, you know, you get enough studies that point in a direction, it kind of gives you some type of indication. So you have some point, some good pointing here, although not perfect. There's another case, 1996, this is still this early period. And this one's very interesting, although it's heavily cited by people who are anti 
transgender, but I think it's still interesting enough to point out. So this is an Indian study. It's in India, um, and it used pimazide, uh, an antipsychotic medication, which is used to treat Tourette. It also has been there's been studies in Ireland about treating body uh, uh, dysmorphia, uh, BDD, and um, so the, there could be an element. It, it's um, it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. So this kind of balances the mood, it minimizes the dopamine uh, in the body. Um, and it allows it to have, build longer chains. And it, some of it's kind of complicated, but it's, a, it's an antipsychotic medication. Uh, they used it on a 23-year-old homosexual patient who believed he was transgender. Um, and the gender dysphoria was very strong. They said the person was monosymptomatic, meaning this was his only mental health issue, was the transgender issue. But when you look at the study, it seems like he has schizophrenia and other things. He, he, he seemed to have other problems, so he might not have been as monosystem, uh, uh, monosymptomatic as the, the doctors have claimed. But it seemed like two milligrams of Pimazide taken daily removed all the gender dysphoria. When after a few months, they dropped him down to one milligram, and the dysphoria came back. Added, went back up to two milligrams, and the dysphoria went away. Well, this is very interesting. So would it could it mean that there is something to do with, you know, these are mood enhancing medications, right? Mood balancing, you know, there's a chemical React, there's a chemical process going on in the body that's causing psychological imbalance. This balances the psychological imbalance by balancing the hormones. Could this be useful for transgender people? Would this be a cure, right? Could there be a cure? Well, this is a single person study, unfortunately, and it has never been repeated. Why it has never been repeated, I don't know. But the but people can overemphasize and say, see, there is a cure. And then there's other people who say, uh, you know, this is just a bunch of uh, nonsense. Well, scientifically, though, the way you deal with things like this is you repeat the study with a larger uh, population, right? Try 50 people with transgender feelings of gender dysphoria with Pimazide for three or four months. Uh, you say, well, treat them like guinea pigs. Well, you know, experimental treatments are experimental. You know, people can sign up for it, volunteer for the study, and be compensated for the study, and you see if it works, right? It's how studies go. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't, never been repeated. I would think that that would be useful, or it might be, might be useful. Now the twin study, this one, the Pimazide's a bit of an outlier, but I think it's still worth mentioning. Uh, the twin study is right at the heart of this matter. Very important study done by Milton Diamond. Milton Diamond did a lot of work with uh, gay uh, and lesbian twins. Uh, you know, that there would seem to be a high likelihood that if one twin were gay, that the second one would also be gay, much higher than the general population. This is very interesting. It kind of pointed to the idea that there could be a genetic element uh, to homosexuality. Well, Milton, Diedman, Milton Friedman, uh, Friedman, Milton Diamond repeats this again uh, with the transgender study. This time he's he's in Hawaii. He's publishing it in the uh, International Journal of Transgender Health. It's not the University of Amsterdam or something like that, but it's still you know it's a decent. He's a well-respected scholar who uh, also uh, outed Dr. Money, right? He's brought about the demise of Dr. Money. So you got to give him some credit for some of that. Um, so 2013, not that long ago. Uh, so he used 110 sets of twins, which would be 220 people. He got them from online, through YouTube, through anything he could find. He also advertised to recruit twins where one twin was transgender to see if there was a correlation there between uh, twins and transgender. So out of this, so 
out of the 110 sets of twins he found um, of identical twins, meaning they are you know, they have the exact same DNA because they're identical twins. The egg, you know, the the egg had split, you know, so it's identical twins. Uh, 30, 13 out of 39, which is 33%, where one twin was transgender, the other one was also transgender uh, for males, uh, natal males. And then uh, 8 out of 35, which was 22.8% of natal females uh, were transgender. So if you recall, the average rate of gender dysphoria, according to the Williams Institute of L. UCLA is 0.6%. So 0.6% would be just, you know, take a random selection of the population and find out what percentage is transgender. 0.6% would claim to be. So 33% or 22% is very high, <laughs> right? Much higher than 0.6. So that shows some type of connection there. Um, now, when you look at uh, non uh, non-fraternal twins, not, uh, right there, they have the same genetic makeup of siblings, but not they're not this genetically the same, right? Uh, uh, so, of them, of males, uh, one out of twenty-one males was also transgender, and none of the fifteen females. Uh, of the fraternal twins uh, were uh, transgender. So it seems like when it's not, what, what, what's, how's that important? Important because if you say, well, twins might be genetically the same, but they also grow up in the same household, they're exposed to the same television shows, the same climate, the same schools, the same everything else. How do you know it's not nurture and not nature, right? How do you know it's genetic and it's not uh, social, right? If you're twins, you grew up in the same place. Well, if you're identical twins, and there's a high correlation between uh, one being transgender, the other one's transgender, and if you have fraternal twins, where they're not genetically identical, um, and then it's not a correlation, well then, it's not, it's not, nature, it's, it's not nurture, it must be nature, right? It's much more likely to be uh, nature, right? The, the, that makes some sense, right? Because genetics is different. Also, Milton uh, Diamond found there were a couple sets of twins where the twins were separated at birth or at a young age. In one of, set of, one of those sets of twins, they didn't even know it but both of them later in life became transgender and they didn't even know about the other one, right? So that's a strong, that's a strong indication there. There's no uh, social component at all connecting them together. They just both happen to be trans l later on in life. And uh, that's a pretty strong correlation to say there must be something genetic there, right? I think, I think that's a pretty strong case, you know, and Milton, Diamond, he doesn't cut open the brain. He's not looking in the brain. He's just looking at these numbers, right? He's just looking at these numbers, and there does seem to be some connection here, right? I was not saying, you know, let me say something else about that. If, if he, if, if it were just purely genetic, and you had identical twins, then if one were transgender, the other one should also be transgender, right? If it's just purely uh, the the genetics uh, of it, you know, if they are genetically identical and one's transgender and 60% of the other one is not transgender, then it's not purely the genes. It must be something like genes plus other exposure, other, other factors, right? Epigenetic, uh, a combination of genes, but not just... Uh, it's not as simple as, well, they have, one's transgender, the other one must be transgender because they have the same genes. There's something else there, the same thing with the homosexual study, that there's a larger correlation between two uh, identical twins being homosexual if one is, but it's not, that there's a, that's not a 100% correlation, right?
So interesting. Again, another epistemological marker that points in a direction, right? That's all it does. It points in a direction. Now, if we look at gray matter, gray matter is another interesting one. Now, gray matter doesn't probably not typically related to um, gender identity. It's probably not. Um, who knows? But it's probably not. There is a dimorphism when it comes to gray and white matter, though. Right? We looked at that in the last question. There is a difference between male gray matter and white gray matter. How that's related to identity is probably there's probably not much of one. But uh, Dr. Letters looked at 24 male to female transsexuals uh, who are not physically or chemically treated. Right, so that's that's interesting, right? That that gets rid of the problem with Dr. Zoe's study in the 1990s. She's also using an MRI machine, so they're not dead. That's that that makes it interesting too, um, and that it also means the average age is younger um, of her test subjects. They're not in their 80s, having died. They're in their 40s, right? So the average age is younger, uh, and she has 24 male to female transgender people and 60 controls right so that uh, is a larger pool of people than the previous studies and when she looks at the gray matter she sees cluster specific boxes she make these boxes of you know, gray matter so women typically have larger gray matter than men so when you're looking at these 22 regions of the brain looking at heterosexual women most of the time they have more gray matter but in two of the regions the, the transgender person uh, male to female had higher gray matter levels than women so women ha usually have more gray matter but in the two, of the 22 regions two regions transgender men transgender male to female individuals had more gray matter now and there was no region where cisgender males had more gray matter so this is unusual right this is this is pointing uh, to the idea that that maybe transgender people might have slightly different gray matter quantities more similar to that of their um, the sex that they were uh, that they ascribe to, right? This is confirming a little bit of what uh, Catherine Wu was pointing out, right? Catherine Wu that says, you know, tra this is proof that transgender people have brains like the opposite sex, right? The, their, their identity. This study's coming out of UCLA, too, by the way. Um, well, is this true, right? Is Catherine Wu correct? Is this now the proof that we needed, the smoking gun? Well, got to slow down right um, no it's not definitive proof of anything right it's not definitive one if you look at the whole brain and the thousands and millions of different combinations of, you know, the many combinations out there two regions uh, within two regions within 22 regions of gray matter where transgender people have slightly more gray matter than females and more than other men that's not definitive proof that their brains are just like that of the opposite sex right it's it's actually saying in 99.9% .9 of the ways it's like their natal sex but in this one way it's different right so it's different in this way and we don't even know which how this way affects gender identity uh, but there but uh, there are some things that are anomalies that make us stop and say hmm I wonder right could this be something right what does it that mean we need to do more research right that's what that means does it mean aha we have the answer no it's not an answer likewise when people like Dr. Paul McHugh say there is no connection, there is no relation, there is no science that points to anything like this. Well, that's also not really accurate, right? There are some things that are pointing in this direction, right? We can't ignore that some things are pointing in this direction. Um, so those are just some things to think about. Um, the other part of this, last part of this section would be, um, what, do, what can we make of it? 
well, does, does this gray matter then uh, mean that uh, when you have more gray matter, you are transgender? Or if you are transgender, you grow more gray matter, right? Is that what it means? Well, not not necessarily, right? Those are those are two options, right? If you're transgender, you grow more gray matter. If you if you have more gray matter, you might be transgender, maybe. But another possibility is if there is a genetic element to this, right? That in the womb, when you're born, there's something genetic that's triggering some type of indirect dominoes effect, right? The SRY genes are going awry in a different direction. Whatever might be causing the person to have gender dysphoria, right? Those feelings of the opposite sex might also be affecting the gray matter, right? It might be a, might be a domino path that's affecting the feminization in more than one way. Not that the gray matter causes this, but it is also an effect of something gone somewhat unusual, right? That's a possibility, and I hope that's clear. We'll see that again. So another one is white matter, right? Gray matter and white matter. So um, this one's out of Barcelona, uh, this study, uh, 2011. Uh, they included 18 female to male individuals. Now this is unusual because most of the time they've been male to female. This time it's female to male. 24 cis males and 19 cis females. So they looked at people who are not hormonally treated uh, and not altered in any way before of this test. And they also tested them for mental illness and none of them were mentally ill. So you have non-mentally ill people. The conclusion of this study looking at white matter, now these are bundles within the brain that go from like front to back and side to side within the brain that move information. Um, men and women have different styles and volumes of this white matter, which is why women have better communication skills than men because they have different or more volume within these, um, these bundles. So. The conclusion is uh, taken right from the study. Our results show that white matter microstructure patterns of untreated female to male transsexuals uh, is closer to the pattern of subjects who share their gender identity, males, than to those who share their biological sex, females. Our results provide evidence for structural differences uh, in the untreated female to male transsexual brains. So. This is the conclusion of this study, points directly to what Catherine Wu said, right? People have opposite sex brains, right? That's what she's, this, that's what the conclusion says. But is this true, right? Is it true? Um, so men have larger, right? Women have more gray matter, but men have more white matter. That's how it goes, right, with these bundles. So if we look at this graph that's by my side, of all the regions in the brain, they have reduced it to four. They were going to look at four. Do transgender female to men have male structures of white matter? Let's look at it. So if we look at the first one here, what the column all the way to the left here is female and it's low, and then all the way to the right, male is a little bit higher, and in the middle is female to male, which is between uh, the female and the male, right? It's between it, it's nearly, ident nearly right in the middle. Uh, but when you look at standard deviation, right, we're only dealing with 18 individuals, so there's a big standard deviation, meaning uh, you know, margin of error, right? Uh, is a, they're identical, right? Between the margin of error, the, there's no, the mar with, the, with the standard deviation, there's no, no difference between the female to male and the female, right? It's within the standard deviation. When we look at the next one, the superior uh, longitudinal felicitudinalus, feliciclulus, uh, the male and the fe the male and the transgender 
are identical. Well, that's an interesting one, right? So that second one is identical, and it is above the standard deviation So by a little bit. So that's interesting. Uh, that one will be interesting. So then we'll look at the third one. It's between the two again, within the standard deviation, doesn't really show anything within the, the last one, within the standard deviation, there's no, there's no difference. So within these four regions, there's one, there's one, the second one, uh, which shows that there is, that it is more like the male than the female, although once you add in the standard deviation, it's not a lot, right? It's, it's it is closer to the male than the female. Not by a lot. Okay, um, so is this definitive proof that f females and males have the same uh, brain structures as 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 their identity? No, this actually shows outright that three out of four do not. Right, <laughs> three out of four do not, and one. M might one might so one region is more like uh, males um, so what does that mean well it means we need a larger subject pool and to repeat the study right it's uh, when you only got one section and it's only by a small margin you need more you need a larger subject pool that's all that that's what it means does it point? Yes, again, it points, right? It points in the direction that there could be something within the transgender brain which is uh, which is there, right? This could be something. The other part of this, this was of homosexual type transgender people, going back to Blanchard. So for those who say that Blanchard's theory is not useful, well, it's still, we're still really looking at that even in 2011, right? Uh, the last study that I have here um, is the most relevant one, the most recent one, and, and it's the idea of an intersex brain. This is in some ways taking Milton Diamond's idea where he talks about an intersex brain, and this is the actual study that could look into it. So Guillaume uh, says it is simplistic to say that the female to male transgender person is a female trapped in a male's body. It's not because they have a male brain, but because they have a transsexual brain. Now this is the insight into here is um, when they look at different parts of the brain, uh, he says on average male to female individuals are composed of male structures, right? So male to female, people born male most of the structures are male, right? Including intracranial volume, gray matter, white matter, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, cort cortical volumes, thickness. Uh, they are unlike men or women, he says. Uh, they mostly male structures, but there are some things which are like other people who are transgender. That's the interesting thing. So it's not that males have female brains, but they have some anomalies that are like other people who are transgender, right? That's that's an interesting insight, right? So it's like a type three brain, right? You have male brain, female brain, and this third type of structures, right? And this makes sense a little bit when we think back to the brain matrix, right? So there's some things that are blue, there's some things that are pink, but if you get enough of a, um, if, uh, if there are enough averages that say, okay, yes, 80% of males have blue and 80 per, males are 80% blue, 20% pink on average, and females 80% pink and 20% blue on average. But if you were to break down those enough and you say, well, let's look at trans brains through that matrix, maybe you might find some areas where it's like, well, a male is repeatedly pink in this one particular area more than average, more than the average male, right? It starts creating the idea that there could be a third set of anomalies, right? You have the male anomaly, the female, right? The male and the female, and you might have a, a, a different anomaly 
for transgender people. That's very interesting. And Dr. Guillemin, when he's doing this, he's looking particularly at the par triangularis, which is an area that deals with speech. Again, not anything to do with identity specifically, but anyway. They found that homosexual type male to female individuals, right? Homosexual type being uh, androphilic, right? Back to Blanchard, right? Those who say Blanchard is dead, right? this is the best science, 2016. They're still using these ideas. Um, they have a thicker uh, pars triangularis uh, than heterosexual men or women, right? So there is a, a, a thicker cortex, right? Uh, this is interesting, right? So it's, a, it's an, an interesting anomaly. Now, male to female individuals, uh, he says, develop masculine, feminine, and demasculinized traits. He would say that females to male have masculine, feminine, and defeminized traits, right? There are some things that are one or the other or both, right? The results are, demonstrate that these abnormalities are like neurodevelopmental disorders, right? It's a nor neurodevelopmental, meaning it happens in the womb as the brain is forming and crystallizing, uh, which reaffirms what Dr. Diamond had originally thought, right? So, again, what is the conclusion of this, right? Well, if I were to have to go back to the beginning, right, the beginning hypothesis of Catherine Wu, do transgender people have brains like that of their identity? She listed all these cases and said, this is proof that, you know, a person, natal male, who says that they're a female, identifies as a female, has a female brain. That's what they're saying. They have a female brain. Well, the one that has the, the person who perhaps has the most proof, Dr. Guillemin, uh, says that is overly simplistic and that's not true. <laughs> uh, not true. Uh, there are anomalies that point to things. Right, that we know. There are anomalies that point to things. What is the proof, right? What is, if we go back to the last video of all the different parts of the brain that are more male, more female. Somebody born male has a almost entirely male brain. There may be some anomalies, right? There may be some anomalies. How significant are those anomalies in terms of gender identity? We don't know, right? That's the best science. <laughs> there are sometimes anomalies and we don't know what effect that has on the human person. Most likely, if perhaps there were neurodevelopmental things going on in the womb that create these anomalies like the little bit of the intersex brain in the cortex or the gray area or the, the, the white matter, or the hypothalamus and the BTSC, or the SOM, or whatever. If there's abnormalities that cause that, there may be a common cause which might also affect gender identity. It's not necessarily that any one of these things causes the gender confusion, but there might be a link points that there might be a common cause, right? There might be a common cause. Could be that when those dominoes were going off, right, the dominoes going in all these different directions, one of them went in a direction that was the, the wrong way, right? It, it, the person was supposed to be developing male in one direction, went in the form of female in some way, uh, leading to a, a demasculinized brain or a defeminized brain. This is the best guess. This is the best guess that we have. Now we'll go in a bit more detail, a few more cases with this type of um, neurodevelopmental theory in chapter eight, the next chapter. Um, and I apologize, this is so long, but I think this is what, it, there's a lot of value in this. Um, I don't know, again, this, would also be a distinction between gender dysphoria and uh, gender ideology. So does everyone who says, oh, I'm non-binary, I'm 
transgender, you know, 14 year olds that half the class come out as transgendered, does this mean that these people are all, you know, there's a neurodevelopmental something going on in their head? Not necessarily, right? We're not, this isn't saying anything about anyone in particular, right? These are often cases taken before there was a bit of a craze about this, right? A bit of a trend. Um, this says nothing about an individual, right? So just to point that out as a cautionary thing, you know, say, well, my daughter came out as trans. So see that, you know, there's science that says that this is real. 0.6% of the population, right? Remember, 0.6% of the population, 30% of your daughter's class came out as trans, right? This is, there is sometimes ideology and it's not based on the um, gender dysphoria. So anyway, so we'll move on next time to chapter eight. I hope you found this useful.